Are you thinking about the footprint of your decisions about plastic recycling and doing the laundry? I thought so. It weighs heavy on my mind all the time, too. Stand by for the skinny on skinnying your laundry, plastic, and recycling footprint. Calling, 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 calling. Call the growth buster. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Welcome to the Growth Busters podcast about sustainable living. I'm Dave Gardner, Growth Buster in Chief. You can explore my work and the issues we discuss at growthbusters.org. Now, there's been a lot of news over the past two months, especially related to climate change. But the holidays, year end accounting, and way too little year end fundraising kept me from putting together a normal episode. Believe me, it's more important now than ever. So we'll get to it in several of our next episodes. Meanwhile, I have a little bonus episode for you. It's a bit ironic, here and now, in the midst of revelations, discussions, and decisions affecting whether human civilization flourishes or comes to an end in our lifetime, that we have a chat about two very mundane things, recycling and doing the laundry. But these subjects do actually matter, because every little thing that 7.5 billion people do on this big blue marble makes a difference. And the very act of practicing things like this puts us in the right frame of mind for making small footprint decisions throughout our day, every day. Joining me to recycle and do the laundry, earth ethic guru from Sydney, Australia, Heidi Bischoff. Heidi blogs regularly about sustainable living at medium.com. Look for a link to her work in the show notes for this episode at growthbusters.org. Well, greetings, Heidi. How are things in Australia? Hi, Dave. Um, Yeah, they're pretty good here. We're starting to come into some warmer weather now. Our spring has dragged on for a really long time, but um, I'm not complaining. I love that time of year. But yeah, we're starting to get some warmer days down here. And does that give you the opportunity to grow some food? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've been trying to make the most of it. I've been out in the garden every day and yeah, we've got a lot of things going to seed and a lot of people seem to pull things out when they start going to seed for some reason, Um, but I just let them go and then we get new seedlings pop up (laughs) in their own good time, you know, whenever the time of year is right for them. Yeah, so I'm just sort of letting them do their thing and some of them are dying off now, so I'm taking them out and then there's new seeds to put in. And yeah, I actually um, really enjoy being out there and it's, you know, it's supposed to be really good good for you to get out in the garden, especially bare feet, apparently. (laughs) That's great. I noticed in uh, the last blog post of yours that I saw, and you may have done another one since then, since we're recording this in November, but the episode isn't going to be released until sometime in early December. You talked a little bit about kind of a different avenue of recycling, and that is buying recycled. I thought that was an important subject that we usually skip. Yeah, that's right. It's something that I've struggled with myself. I thought I'd formed an opinion on this whole thing, and then I was like umming and ahhing a bit. It's quite a difficult area because I had told myself I'm not going to buy recycled products. Um, Well, particularly recycled plastic um, is what I'm most concerned about. But yeah, I told myself I wasn't going to do that because that's just perpetuating demand for plastic. And we really need to get away from disposable plastic. But then I thought, well, actually, I'm kind of in a transition stage at the moment. So I'm still buying disposable plastic, like, you know, milk bottles, that type of thing. So I figure, you know, as long as we uh, want to be able to buy those plastic packaged products, then I think we need to be prepared to buy products that are made from recycled plastics as well. Yeah, it's kind of a tricky catch-22, isn't it? You don't really want to perpetuate the creation of new plastic products, but it doesn't do any good for people to recycle what plastic they're they're recycling if uh, there's no market for it too. Exactly, yeah. So I guess the way I see it is that as an interim thing, you know, for now we, we need to probably support recycled products, but also transition towards, you know, reusable and get away from plastic. But even when it comes to glass and cardboard, 
those types of packaging aren't um, necessarily really green either. Um, apparently a lot of energy goes into both of those. So, yeah, I, I just see it as transitioning towards, you know, bringing your own bottle. Like I just, I was um, pretty happy the other day when I saw um, one of the bulk food stores I shop in, they had milk on tap and I was like, yes. Wow. Yeah. So you bring your own bottle and fill it with milk. Yeah, I will next time. I think I will. So, yeah, it's good to see a move towards that sort of thing. And I heard in the UK that the milkman has started to make a comeback. Well, I'm kind of excited. I'm really excited that we're going to talk about something pretty mundane right now because it seems like so many Growthbusters episodes, a big chunk of the conversation is around, you know, some pretty heavy subjects. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and appropriately so. We really need to address those. Otherwise, we will find ourselves extinguished from the planet and deserving that as well. Mm. But, you know, just because of the power of the masses, we can't ignore the little things that we can do in our daily lives, too. And so today we're going to talk about one of those little things, and that's laundry. Yes. <laughs> How dull is that? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, one of those things that, um, you know, I suppose we all need to do. And um, yeah, but there's a lot more to it than just, you know, buying a biodegradable laundry detergent. There's quite a few aspects there, you know, ways that you can have a more sustainable laundry habits, I guess. Yeah, I was pretty shocked to discover that about 10% of a home's total electricity use goes to washing and drying Close, according to the Natural Resources Defense Council. I don't know if that's a U.S. or North America figure or a global figure, but 10%, that's pretty significant. And I know they tell us that Americans used almost 6 billion kilowatts washing laundry at home last year and 57 billion kilowatts drying it. So it's significant part of your carbon footprint. Yeah, that um, definitely is. And like, I guess, you know, there seems to be an assumption that everyone has a clothes dryer. We don't actually have a clothes dryer. So, you know, maybe our use is a, a bit less than that, hopefully. <laughs> I would hope so. That's great. And I think the clothes dryers are, uh, well, they're the big hogs. And according to the experts, there's only so much you can do to make clothes dryers more efficient. They've been making lots of positive strides in improving laundry washing machines, but not so much on the dryer side. And so I'm glad to hear that you don't have one. And I'm proud to say that we do have a dryer here in our house, but I almost never put my clothes into that dryer. I have a really nice drying rack because I don't have the terrain to really make an outdoor clothesline work very well, but I hang all my clothes up mm. on this drying rack. That's the most efficient clothes dryer you can get. Yeah. And I guess you do something similar. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we have an outdoor clothes line, which is on the north. We're lucky to have our backyard facing north, which is the best access to the sun down here. <laughs> so most of the year, you know, it dries fine out there. You know, in the middle of winter, we might get a few days that are, are cold and wet. And so we, it doesn't dry completely, but we have um, an indoor fold up line. So we just bring it in. And we also have a ventilation system, which is fantastic. So it basically pushes the warm air from the roof down into the house. So it kind of acts like an air conditioner. You can set like a set point temperature and stuff. Yeah, so in summer it pushes cool air down at night and in winter pushes the warm air down in the day. So that's really great to help drying clothes as well. Interesting. I can't believe it, but I've been hanging my clothes to dry for probably about 15 years now. And that's long enough for me to have discovered a real great side benefit, which is my clothes don't wear out nearly as fast. Right, yeah. Clothes dryers are really hard on the fabrics. Yeah, yeah, I guess the high temperatures wouldn't be that great for them. So um, fair enough. I think people in, in colder climates, that they would probably need a clothes dryer. But yeah, if you're in a more temperate or warmer climate, then yeah, I would recommend either like avoiding having one or just like you, just only use it when you absolutely need it and use the washing line. I suspect this is another area of our lives where we tend to opt for convenience. 
It's just super easy to just chuck the clothes straight from the washer into the dryer and then press the button and walk away yep. and come back an hour or two later or whatever and they're, they're all dry. But um, we've just always hung clothes out on the line. So it's like, yeah. Whatever. Well, that reminds me of my childhood. We definitely didn't have a clothes dryer in the house when I was uh, a young kid growing up. But uh, yeah, you know, all these things that we're finding are... Uh, Adding to our carbon footprint were looked at as great miracles of modern science by the typical housewife or especially working mothers. Even like easier ways to pop popcorn. You know, we're too lazy to just pop popcorn the old-fashioned way these days. Sad to say. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, we used to just do it in a pot. Yeah, but I'm glad to hear that you're keeping things simple around the house. So do you have some interesting things to share with us about laundry? You know, the stuff that I've kind of learned myself from my own journey is if you're buying a washing machine, I would recommend getting a front loader because they are more efficient both in terms of water and energy use. Yes. So you'd be saving money on your water and your energy bills. Plus, they also have more temperature options and more spin speed options, which is a bonus. And the other fantastic thing is you only need about half the amount of soap as a top loader. So to me, it's a kind of a no brainer. And we, you know, as you would know, I tend to go for quality appliances that are going to last a longer time and that are, you know, more sustainable. Something people might not always think about is the embedded energy in a product. It requires energy and, of course, raw materials to manufacture a product. So if you're buying cheap ones that have to be replaced every five or even every eight years, no matter how efficient the machine is in its daily use, you're being pretty wasteful just by not buying something of high quality that's durable and will last a long time. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, So as well as that, I would say that if you are going to be using a clothes dryer, then use a higher spin speed for your washing. That way you don't have to put your clothes in the dryer for as long. Good point. Yeah. There's also the issue of temperature. So we always used to wash in cold water just for sustainability reasons. But we actually had a problem with our machine a couple, few years ago now. It was getting like this residue build up, like, and it was coming out all over the clothes. And and I'm like, what is this? So it turned out we got the guy out and he's like, oh yeah, this this is detergent residue because we use natural like biodegradable detergents, you know, eucalyptus or something. So it was kind of like an algae type stuff. And I'm like, this is from the detergent. And it was because we were washing in cold. It wasn't dissolving the detergent properly. Oh, shoot. Yeah. So he said to me, you need to actually wash warm so now we do sort of about 50 degrees even though it's got a setting up to 90 degrees I'm like why would you need that sort of 50 degrees 30 for maybe for delicates but it turns out the machine actually heats the water itself we didn't have a hot water connection so we thought oh we have to wash in cold anyway but yeah apparently front loaders a lot of them do that but that also means that, yeah, they a lot of the front loaders don't have a connection for hot water, which apparently that would be a disadvantage if you have solar hot water, for example, then you can't actually use your solar hot water f- to wash. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, yeah. I think you can get some front loaders do have the connection. So, yeah, if you do have solar hot water, then, then maybe look for a machine that has that connection. But uh, I guess it's about making sure that you get a detergent that is designed for cold, that I think maybe that some detergents these days, they have fancy enzymes or something that, you know, they can dissolve in cold water. So... Yeah, I think but we always go for natural biodegradable ones. So did you find then that you just use less of it in a front loader than you would have in a top loading machine, the natural detergent? No, it was just that we have to use a warm wash instead of using a cold wash in order to dissolve the detergent properly. But didn't you also use less detergent when you when you got that front loading machine? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's the first washing machine I've ever owned. So oh, yeah, okay. So yeah, it takes half the amount of detergent as a top loader does. So half a scoop basically for one load. 
We will be getting solar hot water when we're doing some renovations to our house. So we'll be getting um, solar panels installed as part of that. Uh, so, sorry, solar hot water system. Um, and I need to just check if our, if our machine has the connection for solar hot water, though. I suppose another way that you can avoid washing so much is to just wait until you've got a full load. So we only wash our whites maybe once a month, if that, because we don't wear as many white clothes. So we just wait until we've got a full load. You know, one of the things that made me decide that it was time to have this conversation was I had run across an interesting article on the internet called Nine Ways to Save Energy Doing Laundry. Thank you, Kimberly Janeway, for writing that. And that was at Consumer Reports. And I will include a link to that in the show notes because Heidi and I won't address everything on the list that Miss Janeway gave us. I didn't even know that there were, and I hate to go back to dryers because let's just stop drying our clothes. Let's just hang them on the line. But I didn't know you could buy a heat pump clothes dryer. Yeah, I'd never heard of that either. So yeah, if you did need to have a clothes dryer, then that could be a good option. Yeah, apparently they use about half of the uh, energy. They take a long time. So you need to be patient, but, right, uh, yeah. but they use a lot less energy. And yeah, and, and Janeway mentioned doing full loads. That's almost seems like a no-brainer, but I'm glad you brought that up, Heidi. Some machines, though, I think they may sort of sense the level of the, like the amount of clothing that's in the machine and adjust the water level accordingly. So if you've got a really smart machine, then... <laughs> But then again, you're still using the energy to wash, so um, it's not just about the water. I also have a couple of tips for ways we can avoid plastic in doing our laundry. Oh, boy. (laughs) Sock it to me. So one is with uh, pegs. If you have a clothesline and you use um, clothes pegs to hang them up, rather than getting plastic clothes pegs, you can now get bamboo or stainless steel ones. I'm not sure how widely available they are in the supermarket, but you can get them on Amazon. So they're either, you know, biodegradable or recyclable at the end of their life. Very good. And then another is buying powder rather than liquid. A lot of powder does come in cardboard boxes rather than plastic tubs. Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. And then the bigger package, the better. So if you can get a two kilo box rather than one kilo, that's less packaging. Or better still buy in bulk from like from a bulk store. And then there's one other area which I'm not sure if you're familiar with, but that is the issue of microfiber pollution from our clothing. And that's become a really big issue recently. Yeah, I heard a little bit about it, but I'm looking forward to taking advantage of your expertise. What do you know? (laughs) Apparently, whenever we wash our clothes, they shed millions of... Originally, they thought it was just thousands, but apparently it's millions of or up to millions of tiny fibres in every wash that we do. If we have, you know, a lot of synthetic clothing, like, for example, a fleece jacket sheds about one million fibres in a wash. And because these are so small, they don't get captured at the wastewater treatment plant. So they make it out to the ocean and researchers have found these fibres present in tiny little uh, marine animals. And so obviously they're going up the food chain. And so we're going to end up eating these tiny plastic fibres. And darn, because that's, you know, those fleece jackets, I think, aren't they mostly made out of recycled plastic water bottles? Some of them are, which you kind of think, oh, gee, that's a good thing, you know, <laughs> yeah. supporting recycled products. But, uh, you know, I've made a decision. We're not buying any new fleece jacket. No more fleece. No. <laughs> Does that apply to all other synthetic fabrics at your house too? Pretty much. We're minimizing it. And a lot of clothing contains polyester or acrylic or nylon, you know, some form of plastic, which is really frustrating. So sometimes you don't have a choice. But we're just trying to minimise the amount of synthetic clothing we're buying and, you know, opting for for not necessarily cotton unless it's organic cotton because cotton's got a, a whole other bunch of issues associated with that. But, um, yeah, probably bamboo and hemp and organic cotton and flax or linen. They're probably some of the best um, sustainable fabrics out there that um, are great alternatives to plastic fabrics. (laughs) Well, and you know what? That gives me a great segue to circle back to something that I 
wanted to mention about laundry itself, and that is that I have heard that a lot of people have a tendency to wash their clothes a lot more often than they need to. Right. Wear a shirt once and throw it in the laundry. Well, that really is going to make your footprint big just in terms of energy and water use and wear out your clothes faster. Some people that I run into who are very committed to being really good stewards of this planet, they will wear their clothes, gosh, I don't know, 10 times before they throw them in the wash. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can use the smell test to know when you've taken that, that step too far, perhaps. Yeah, I was going to say that. That's what we do. Um, I mean, I'll change my underwear every day, but um, other clothes, I'll tend to stretch them out and get um, a bit more mileage out of them. Also, that reminded me of another great brand, I guess, Icebreaker. I don't know if you've heard of it. And they make merino clothing, thermal underwear, but now they've just established, you know, a whole variety of different clothing. You can basically get your whole wardrobe from Icebreaker now. It's fantastic. And they will laugh. They will go the distance. <laughs> so you can wear them and wear them and wear them. And they just don't smell. It takes a while to, until they start smelling. You can actually, I love it because you can actually trace your clothing back to the sheep it came from, like back to the location and the, the station, the sheep station that it came from in the mountains of New Zealand. So I think that's pretty cool. Very cool. What about the pods? Uh, we were talking about laundry detergent and why you might want to use powder rather than liquid uh, because of the container situation. What do you think about those pods that they have powder detergent, but they're individually wrapped. I have this aversion to anything that's single serving. So I worry about this extra packaging. So I don't know what they make the pods out of. I've seen those. My brother has them. And I, I was suspicious because I thought, well, it, it's fine, I guess, if, if the, the pod is made from like a plant-based material because it's supposed to just dissolve. So you would think, yeah, maybe it's just made from a plant-based material. But there was kind of a suspicion I had that maybe it includes some plastic in there. And so that's something I'd better look into that a bit further because I'm not really sure. So keep listening to the Growth Busters podcast because we're going to revisit that subject soon. Either Heidi or I will see if we can't find the answer. I'm so curious about it. I'm surprised I haven't gotten on the Google machine and uh, sought some answers to it because it does feel and look a lot like plastic. It bothers mm -hmm. me a little bit. And if you're listening and you know the answer to this, then by all means, uh, shoot us an email or uh, type a comment on the webpage with this episode or make a comment on the Growth Busters podcast Facebook page and we'll give you credit and share the information that you give us on the next episode. But yeah, you know, get out if you've got a clothesline or even if you don't, then maybe think about installing one and it gives you more time out in the sun and uh, more time outdoors, which we all need these days. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, get, get out and take advantage of that uh, free solar energy. <laughs> Sounds great. Here's a quick update, early January of 2019. Happy New Year. We're just now getting this episode published that Heidi and I recorded in November. Apologies for that long delay. But Heidi wants me to share with you links to two products designed to capture microfibers in our washing machines. Also, she turned up a piece about laundry pods indicating there isn't a big environmental price tag for that convenience. Check the show notes for these links. If you're thinking about the footprint of your plastics and laundry decisions and habits, then you're likely thinking about a few dozen other things that either expand or contract your footprint on the planet. So please, consider the small things you can do, even as you vote, run for office, write your elected representatives, march, and or rally to accomplish the big systemic changes we need in our system. And thanks for listening and acting. I promise not to make you wait over a month for the next episode of the Growth Busters podcast. Till then. Some may dream to paint mountains and streams, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Some may just want more, but don't know what it's for, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather 
But no, not us, we are the growth busters. Calling, 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 calling. Call the growth busters.